In this episode of The Cole Memo, I sit down with a licensed courtesan, which is a professional way of saying a legal prostitute. If you're wondering why the hell I'm talking to legal prostitutes, it's likely because you haven't checked out episode number one in our series on the legal sex industry. More specifically, we're discussing the licensed prostitution industry in Nevada. If you'd like to see episode one, which explains why in the hell we're talking about this subject, it's less than 10 minutes and you can stream it at thecolememo.com slash sex. Today I speak with May December, a person that has experience working in the licensed sex industry within the state of Nevada. Folks, you're listening to The Coal Memo. I am your host, Cole Preston. Every episode is released in audio, video, and transcript format. To find the transcript, audio, or video version of any episode, please refer to the description of the episode that you're listening to now. Within that description, you can find a link that will take you to our website, which will display the transcript for this episode and the platforms where you can find this episode in audio or video formats. If you're unable to locate the episode description on whichever your plat whichever platform you're listening from, simply note the episode number and visit thecolememo.com. From there, you can find the corresponding episode and then you'll be able to access the audio, video, and transcript version of that episode. You might also find any links that we reference during the episode so that you might be able to do your own research or connect to individuals that I speak to, like May, December. If you're not listening to this episode of The Cole Memo on Patreon, then you are listening to this episode later than our patrons. To become a patron, go to thecolememo.com slash Patreon. Once again, that's the colememo.com slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. It's a great way to support our show. One of the best ways to support our show is absolutely free. Subscribe to or follow our show. Leave us a positive review from wherever you're listening to us from. Favorite this episode. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment or post a review. Your engagement and support is appreciated. Today is December 7th, 2023. And if you've seen episode one, which again, if you haven't, I will encourage you to check it out. It's less than 10 minutes long. You can watch it at thecolememo.com slash sex. It lays out why we are talking about this subject. If you've seen episode one, you'll know that I've been working on this series for quite some time. I spoke to May sometime in October of 2022, I believe around October 31st. Enjoy this episode of The Colt Memo. Hey, May, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm really excited to be sitting down and speaking with you about um, a very interesting topic. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but first, go ahead and introduce yourself to my audience and feel free to plug your socials and whatever else you're doing. Oh, okay. Well, my name is May December. I am a burlesque performer. Um, also, I've worked as a courtesan in Nevada for the last year. Um, the easiest way to find me on socials is through my link tree. It's selfiepop.com backslash May, December, M-A-E, December like the month. Um, I've got my Twitter, my Instagram, my Facebook, my OnlyFans, and my Fansly, um, Pornhub. All of my links um, are through that, that one link. So that's the easiest way. Yeah, and folks, if this makes it easier on you, we will have that link in the podcast description. So if you look in the show notes for this episode, you'll see that link. It'll take you to all of May's socials and you can connect and have a good time. Um, so so May, um, you mentioned you were a courtes courtesan and a burlesque performer. 
Um, some people, I think most people would know what a burlesque performer is, but a courtesan is, uh, what is that? Um, it's a nice term for, uh, the legal prostitution that we have. Um, it's kind of a classic term that we've brought back. Um, some people are very offended by the word, um, prostitute or hooker, or, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm very comfortable with choices that I've made in my life. Um, but I do enjoy the classy nature of the term courtesan, uh, as I, you know, I, I come across that with burlesque too. Uh, some of us will describe ourselves as, uh, fancy strippers. Some of us get offended, uh, by the term stripper, but let's just, you know, keep it simple. <laughs> it's yeah. easy descriptions for people that are new to the arena. So uh, courtesan is definitely a nice term for legal prostitute. Gotcha. Now, how did you get in into the this line of work, if you will? So um, I had a very professional job um, in management, uh, running things for somebody else's company. And my very best friend in the whole world, Miss Tori, um, who you spoke to, um, she was off doing hot girl shit, as we said, um, hot girl stuff, not sure. <laughs> um, and you, I can, was you can let it fly hot girl shit. That's what she was um, doing. <laughs> good. Okay, good. Um, so I was teasing her about, you know, I, I want to go do hot girl shit with you. Like, how do I get to do stuff like that, you know, and get out of this, you know, sad existence that I'm <laughs> I'm living when I want to have fun, you know, and I don't even remember how it got brought up, but, um, the idea came to me to look online and see what's going on in the Nevada and see if, um, oh, I remember what it was. I had a friend that worked at the chicken ranch. That's what it was. She's no longer working out there anymore. Um, but I did have a friend that was working at the chicken ranch and she was like, you need to apply out here. Like you would have so much fun. And so I did, but then I didn't stop there. I thought I'm just going to apply at all of them. So um, I applied it at a bunch of them. And then the one that I was at was the first one that emailed me back. And so I just thought, fuck it. We only live once. Let's try it. Yeah. And when can you let's step back for you when what when was this like how long ago was this that you made this decision so this was um almost exactly a year ago um it was in august when i um i got the response back from them and a few weeks of back and forth discussions uh with them finding out the details of what it what it would entail what i needed to do what kind of things did they like like what was that like did like like, was it just like, you know, you got to take a test weekly? What what were some of the things they told you when you got introduced to this? That was, that was one of the things. Um, you have to get a license through the sheriff's department. So they wanted to make sure that, you know, is your record clean? Can you get a license from uh, the state? Uh, will your background come up clean? Uh, I used to work for the state of Texas uh, as a corrections officer. So... I, I was like, oh, I'm not worried about that. Like, I'm, I've got the cleanest record of any hooligan that you know. I'm sweet and innocent. Look at me. <laughs> so I wasn't worried about that. And then um, they said, you know, I have to get tested um, through their doctor. Um, and once those two things happen, then I'm cleared as a courtesan. Very cool. Very cool. So uh, awesome. Um, what was the, I, I did, I meant to ask Tori this, what was the interview process? Like, was it, was, I mean, you just mentioned that they went through the regulations and how you could get your license, but like before that conversation, what was the interview? Like, was it like, <laughs> you know? Well, um, I sent in, um, uh, they have a section on all of their websites that say, you know, come work for us, you know, whatever. And so I filled that out and sent it to them. And then they emailed me back. Um, when you send those in, it asks for a picture 
And of course I had modeling pictures cause I do modeling and the burlesque and everything. So I sent them a, a few really good pics of me and then they emailed me back and they asked me to send some more pictures and asked me for my social medias and um, asked me for, you know, height, weight, hair color, eye color, uh, measurements. Uh, they asked me all of those kind of questions. Uh, the first interview with the phone was set up um, then. And their head of HR asked me, you know, are you comfortable? Have you ever done sex work before? Um, are you comfortable with the aspects that come with it? Um, all of, you know, we just came out of COVID. So of course, one of their questions was, you know, are you comfortable with close contact with other people? Um, that was kind of a big, I guess, after COVID question that they have to ask now. Yeah, um, sure. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a truly intimate job. Yeah, I mean, truly. <laughs> well, know. and when I went out there, we still had to wear masks. So, wow. um, I wore like a while mask you were, course. while you were Working. in the lineup or while, oh, while you're in, in the parlor, so lineups and everything, you had to wear masks. Um, yeah. of course, as soon as you got to your room, you didn't have to, um, I, uh, got fully vaccinated. I was fully vaccinated before, um, I made it out there. So I wasn't myself worried about it. It was just a very peculiar scenario to think about, you know, we have to be so careful being close and let's stay six feet apart, but we're going to a room to become in intimate with each other. <laughs> So it was definitely an interesting. It puts a whole new spin, you know, like uh, when people would complain about COVID, they're like, oh, it's so silly that we have to wear a mask and then go to, then when we sit at the table, we can take our masks off and eat as if the virus has the dignity to be like, oh, wait a minute, they're eating. You literally take the guests back and possibly kiss them, <laughs> right? Well, so. and that's, you know, and that's something a lot of courtesans don't do. They, they won't, um, that's okay. considered a GFE service. Um, so that's a specialty in and of itself. What is um, GFE? A girlfriend experience. Oh. So you'll have, um, you'll have basically sex menus. Um, and each courtesan's sex menu is different. Um, what every, everybody offers something different and defines things differently. So you really have to speak with um, who you're working with um, and define what that's going to look like. It's pretty similar to any kind of intimate contact you're going to have with anybody. If you are very devoted to consent, um, if you have, you know, put yourself into that situation where you want to make sure like everything that you do is with consent, um, then you're going to have that talk. Um, we were already kind of used to it, me and Tori, just because we do, um, participate in BDSM. And with BDSM, you sit down before you do a scene and you discuss exactly what you want to do in that scene. Make sure that you're both on the same page. It's very similar um, because you want to make sure that, you know, if this guy tries to kiss me, he already told me, oh, I really want to kiss you. Is that going to be okay? So there's no surprises. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's it's really talked out and and let me ask you this like what if things i don't mean to get too off on a hypothetical but what if things start getting hot and heavy and i like change what i want like does that mean like like oh let me add that to your tab right now or is it like hey we didn't discuss this if you if um, we want to it, it's definitely a depending on what it is too um it can be a totally like eh, let's stop um gotcha. You, you didn't pay for this service. If you want to add that, then we can do that. But it requires stopping the party and going back to the booking window. Oh, gotcha. So um, usually what I would do in those situations is just tell them, hey, you know, if you want, if you really want to do that right now, we do have to stop the party um, and go pay for additional services um, to do that. If you want, then we can do what we already agreed to do. And then we can rebook the party at the end um, to do that, whatever it is. Gotcha. 
So what, what was your experience like when you got hired? What was training like and the whole Um, introduction? So training was kind of fun. Um, They assign you uh, another girl to be your big sister. So uh, you have to be a little sister until you have completed three successful dick checks, which we would call DCs. So um, we would we would pretty much just follow the big sister around. Um, They give you a huge book of um, secrets, they called it, um, that you can't leave laying around or anything. Um, It was really a disorganized book full of uh, memos and emails that were 15 years old and contradicted every other one. And it was a clusterfuck. (laughs) What was it meant for? Um, It's supposed to be guidance of like the way they do things. And from what I've been told, it's different per house. Um, You know, every house is run differently. So it's really house rules and how they like to do things. Um, What do you, what do you mean the way they do things? um, Just little things like um, a, a big rule there was you can't have open flame. So you can't do any wax play. You can't have open candles um, and it would give you, you know, suggestions like you can go to Walmart and get the battery operated candles or, you know, you could do like LED lights um, and stuff like that. That's not an open flame. Um, Policies about, um, you know, how long your shift has to be. Um, that, you know, you're technically an independent contractor, but they do want you um, very loosely to follow their, um, their rules, just the rules for the house. Um, what you really get most of the education, though, is from your big sister. So um, your big sister is really going to show you the ropes. Um, there's a lot of etiquette. There's a lot of superstition. There's um, a lot of nuances to to working in a brothel, and I, it goes all the way down to how you stand in a lineup, how you behave when you're in the parlor. Um, those kind of things are very, very important there um, because it will make or break your relationship with the other girls. Um, dirty hustling is really frowned upon between the girls. So it really teaches you how to avoid that. Um, So you can never be like, oh, well, I just. What is dirty hustling? I think Tori may have explained it, but I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, Well, there's different, you know, unwritten rules. Like um, you have to, like if you're standing in a lineup, there's a specific way that you need to stand. Um, You can't, you know you can't like wiggle around a lot. You can't wink. You can't lick your lips. You can't even communicate with them. Correct. Until you go to the negotiation. You can't talk to them at all. And they will come in when they don't know. And, um, our host is looking down the hallway to see if there's any more girls coming. Um, sometimes they'll be like, Oh, Hey, how are you doing today? You know, you all look beautiful and we're just standing there smiling. (laughs) And it feels so awkward and it makes you feel really like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm being so rude, but we're not allowed to. Um, and even if, um, if a girl is sitting outside when they come in and ring the doorbell, um, we can't even say, oh, hey, somebody will let you in in just a minute. You can't talk to them. Like you can't talk to them before they do a lineup. That's not okay. Um, there's just a lot of little things like that. Gotcha. One of the things you mentioned that Tori mentioned that I've also read on the internet is, is the idea that they're, they want you to stay for a minimum amount of time. Is that something you're familiar with or you heard of? Yes. So they do ask, um, they ask for at least two weeks a month. um, If you're going to, to work in, in at least the one that I was at. So um, they want you to work a minimum of two weeks, which really I found the sweet, the sweet spot to be about two and a half to three weeks. Um, you really don't want to work less than that because the first week, um, you know, you come, you fly in, you have to have the doctor 
on Wednesdays is when we would doctor. So you have to wait until Thursday to be cleared by the doctor to even get on the floor. So that's Thursday night is your first time that first week that you actually have a chance to even interact with guests. So um, you really want to stay at, at least two and a half to three weeks. Gotcha. And so Tori mentioned that, you know, some people are expected, like people would go to sleep with their makeup on because you're expected to work 24 hours. Is that a true expectation? Um, from what I've been told in some of the brothels, yes, uh, you're pretty much on call. So that means if anybody comes in and there's a bell, you're expected to be in lineup. Um, at the brothel that we were in, um, we were only expected to be in lineups for 12 hour shifts. So um, they were tw uh, 12 hour shifts and then 14 hour shifts on Friday and Saturday night. Yeah, but you got so, lunch yeah. and stuff, right? They g gave you lunch and- Yeah, yeah. Um, the Why service was hit or, uh, hit or miss there sometimes. Um, of course, we had one, one cook for quite a while, so she can't obviously work every single day. Um, so sometimes it was just pizza. They would bring us pizza or, um, oh man, it was the most unhealthy food. I gained so much weight. I gained so much weight there. They just fill you full of candy and snacks and the most fattening snacks you could think of like chips and cookies and cake. And yeah, I never, I did not understand it. Cause I was like, do you want us to all just right like um yeah i gained about 10 pounds working up there just because that's you know they they barely offer you anything healthy so um we did have refrigerators and they got us an air fryer and some microwaves so um i would try and just get food from walmart you know that i could cook myself in an air fryer or whatever so that I could try and get enough um, vegetables and try not to eat all the junk food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so back to really quick, I wanna get back to food uh, in a second, but for for folks, so you mentioned, and Tori mentioned that too, that it wasn't your, I have about said dispensary because we always talk about cannabis on here. It wasn't your brothel um, that, that, that it was happening at, but, those those folks that are expect to expected to work those like 24 hour shifts and like i said we've read about and heard about um pe you know pe people literally going to sleep in their makeup uh because if the bell goes off they want to be ready you know at a moment's notice i mean what do you think about those working conditions i'm sure you're glad you didn't have those working conditions but do you care to comment on like it, it would seem that there would be state state regulations to help, to prevent some of those things, you know, it just seems. So brutal. this is, this is my thing. And there were girls at the brothel that I worked in that would do those things. Um, I did it many times. Um, we called it sleeping pretty, um, where we would just sleep on top of our bed until there was a bell. Um, I feel like if it's your choice to do that, obviously, yes. Um, do I feel like it would be amazing if there was uh, a union for sex workers? I am a socialist. So therefore my answer will always be yes, we need to organize. Um, do I think that that's a thing in all sex work? Absolutely. I think that all sex workers, there should be um an international group of sex workers i know um there was actually a documentary on a strip club in uh california that did so i don't know where they're at right now with that because that happened in the late 90s but i don't feel like sex workers are good at unionizing um it's a hard industry because women jump in and out of it so much. Um, I do feel like if we were able to organize um, as a nation, sex workers, then maybe we um, we could help a lot of the sex trafficking that happens 
a lot of the violence that happens and a lot of the people in power in legal sex work that probably shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to ask, I mean, I, I don't mean to jump, jump to this, uh, but you know, you brought it up. So like, <laughs> yeah, there's a big power differential between the brothel owner and the sex worker. And like you say, they're kind of at the whim, I feel like of the, the, the brothel owner, they, they, they come in a few weeks at a time and therefore that makes it harder to organize. Do you think that, so there are some critics, even people that are advocates of, of, you know, decriminalizing and legalizing sex work. There are critics of the way Nevada has done it. Do you think, I was thinking about this this morning, do you think it should be like a license to cut hair? And by that, I mean, like in most places with a license to cut hair, it doesn't matter the venue you work at, as long as you have a professional license to do that service, you can do it wherever you can do it at home. You can do it at, uh, you know, if, if there's a business that has like a shared working space, which is how a lot of people that do hair do it they like join a shared working space with other people that are licensed to do hair do you think that would be a better way uh to do this whole thing you know so and and this is this is the thing is that i'm a licensed cosmetologist myself so um and i've dealt with people talking about taking away licenses that that should be the way i fully support licensing i fully support that um, I do love the idea of having a safe place where, you know, there's security, there's, you know, but there's still not, it, no place that is legal right now has 100% safety. Um, and that's with any kind of sex work, um, even strip clubs. Strip clubs are a prime example of a legal industry that is in a lot of times run in ways that it shouldn't be run. They find dancers, they um, take half of their money from the stage. It's the same with brothels. Um, I do feel like there's better ways to do it. I feel like people who have made those decisions have never done sex work because our country is so good at, at slut shaming. Um, I myself am a student. I'm going um, to school for my bachelor's for political science. Um, would I absolutely love to run for something someday? Yeah. Will my tattoos hold me back? Yeah. If I didn't have tattoos, what else would hold me back? My history of sex work. And I know that. I don't think it's fair. Um, but it, it, it does sit in the back of my head as being something, you know, somebody down the road will use that against me. Um, do I think that we should be in an actual democracy where it doesn't matter that we need people from different backgrounds making the laws and maybe we should look at experts in the field, so to speak, uh, when we're passing laws on things? Of course I do. Uh, we currently live in a country where we have and nothing but white men making decisions for women's uteruses. So I don't hold my breath um, that big changes that'll benefit sex workers will ever happen. Um, do I want to do what I can to raise my voice for that? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I in, in simple terms, I, I do want to see it decriminalized. Um, I would like to see it licensed. I would like to be able to go to my state capital and do a background check and sign up for testing here and be allowed to do sex work in the state that I live in. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, am I okay with regulating the industry? Yeah, I am. As long as I get to help decide how that's regulated. Yeah. So in this, in the spirit of like, you know, being that voice, um, which this is one of the main reasons I brought you on. I am, you know, if it's not obvious enough, I'm a proponent of the decriminalization of sex work. I think that it's great. That's why I was, when you asked if I, if you could plug your thing, I was like, of course, that's part of this. Like, I want to be able to help you with that. Just like I help any other person that comes on this show. Um, so with that said, I, I wanted to, I just feel like this, the way that this industry is set up, there's a lot of room for bad working conditions. And so 
part of this conversation that I've been having is how, how can we make it better? And I talked to Tori about it. And some of the things you've both mentioned are things. Here's the thing. I don't live anywhere near Nevada. You, you're on the Chillinois podcast right now, if I didn't make that clear. So I'm from Illinois. In this moment, in case you're wondering, the reason I say that you're on the Chillinois podcast right now is because, again, when I was recording these interviews almost a year ago, that's what this show used to be called. I just wanted to jump in here really quickly in case you hear me say that again. This is the Cole Memo, not the Chillinois podcast. This was the Chillinois podcast, but now it is the Cole Memo. Enjoy the rest of the episode. And just through like simple Googling and YouTube, a lot of the things that you've mentioned that I've brought up, that you've brought up, I've heard. And uh, it's like, I'm not an investigative journalist by any stretch, but I can just, I've looked at different perspectives from, from different sex workers, from different legal sex workers. And I've heard all the same things, the junk food, um, tough hours. Like it's good. I heard from both you and Tori that you could, that you didn't have, weren't subjected to the 24 hour shifts, which is, you know, better to hear, um, like that you chose to, which sounds more in line with the way everybody describes the legal sex industry, that you're an independent contractor, you make your own decisions, right? So if you choose to do a 24 hour shift, that's your choice, but to be required, that just seems like it does seem like, I, I know this sounds like a jump, but it seems like slave labor. Cause it seems like, Hey folks, Cole here from the future, December 7th. Once again, the interview you're watching is from October 31st, 2022, roughly approximately. Um, I just wanted to jump in here because I said something to the effect of this seems like slave labor. And it's because at the time, I think I wasn't aware of the fact that in other industries, uh, you can be subject to working long shifts and you could be expected to sleep on site waiting for a bell, much like has been described in this episode where a girl might sleep pretty. And uh, so it's not exactly like that, but let me give you a few examples. Firefighters, they will be laying down and when a bell rings, they're expected to get up and get their clothes on and jump into action, just like working girls. Um, people in healthcare, they have to work pretty, pretty crazy shifts. So I wanted to add a little bit of, a con of context here. I felt like maybe me invoking slave labor was not exactly fair with that said i do think it is a fair conversation to wonder why if they are if these working girls are independent contractors why they would have to work 12 hour shifts i don't know anything about independent contracting but the way that it sounds is that if you were an independent contractor you would work whenever the hell you want I don't know why I said it in that Southern accent, but that's the impression I was under. I don't know, folks, if you're listeners and you're independent contractors, maybe you know more than me, but I just wanted to quickly drop in here with a little bit of thought, uh, maybe uh, an afterthought that I had. Um, you know, It's been a while since these conversations were recorded, so I thought it was a, a valuable thought to add. Enjoy the rest of the episode. In, in most states, you can't even like in Walmart, you can't make somebody work 24 hours straight. I don't think maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, um, no, but uh, no, it's very different. Um, I, I feel like, you know, that is a loophole that's that's utilized um, both ways. You know, yeah. uh, it's utilized uh, in all legal sex work. Um, I was a stripper for most of my 20s. and um, with that, um, you know, clubs fine you, you have to pay stage fees, you have to pay um, all of the workers that work there, um, you know, and in, in the brothel industry, they take half of every right. dollar that you make. So, you know, what are the benefits that you're getting when they're not only charging you room and board, um, but they're taking half of every dollar room and board. Um, you know, what are the amenities that are making that worthwhile? Um, you know, all of the fees this year went up and 
the last probably four months that I worked there, we didn't even have a housekeeper. So, you know, okay, you raised my room and board and now I'm doing my own laundry and I'm cleaning my own room. Doesn't make sense. Right. Um, you know, they, they don't market you. Uh, some of that is state law. Um, there's certain ways that they're allowed to, to market you and there's certain ways they're not. Um, but again, you know, that's also, uh, issues with them. So, um, there were plenty of attempts to censor me from marketing myself in ways that I don't think was appropriate to do. But, um, also again, like some of that was state law stuff. Um, it's considered solicitation. Right, to, you have to be to like talk careful. Prices. So yeah, you have to be very careful with the way you word things, and that makes it really hard to be able to market yourself. Um, Not to get too in the mud, but can you give me just a little example of where where you maybe felt censored? Like, did you say something like, "Oh"? Um, well, I started I started a a Reddit um, called Brothel Talk, and I was specifically told I need needed to delete it. Um, I did not delete it. <laughs> I just said, okay, I will. And then I, I just, I just didn't advertise it on platforms that I knew I was being watched on. Um, because that was what brought attention to it was I had, I had posted a very good article that I wrote. I wrote an article on the history of, um, STDs in the brothels. Um, because I had a client ask me, you know, is it really clean? Uh, how do I know that I'm not going to catch something? And so I started doing research on it and I found it very interesting. I'm very interested in, in specific things like that. So I wrote a very good article, in my opinion, um, on the cleanliness of the girls that work in the brothel industry. And I was told that it was, uh, that it needed to only be posted in our specific forum and I wasn't allowed to post it in public forums. It's still up there. You can you can find it on my Reddit right now. Because I wrote it. I'm proud of it. I'm not going to take it down. You can't make me. <laughs> I'm a very defiant little girl. Yeah. So another thing we've heard about in in Tori said it wasn't at your location, but people weren't allowed to leave. Um, sometimes at all, sometimes not after certain points. So those are called closed brothels. Um, a closed brothel system, um, you're not. And their logic for that is that, um, you know, some of the girls would go out on their time off and work illegally. Um, we don't, we don't know if they, you know, leave on their day off and come back and it's in between testing periods. You know, we can't guarantee that they're coming back clean. So I get it. Um, to me, at first, I thought, oh, I could never work in that. But, you know, I, the longest run I did was like a seven week run. And I think I maybe left to go to Walmart once in seven weeks. Like I'm kind of a homebody myself anyway. So I was like, you know, I think I could handle a closed brothel. I don't think that would bother me at all. Um, and I do know from what I've read is that the closed ones have actual restaurants on site. Um, one of them I know I was told has literally an on-call chef. So it's not like where we get one meal a day that's set out in warmers all day. And hopefully it's enough, which it was never enough for how many people were there. But um, they actually have where you can say, hey, you know, can you make me this or can you make me that? And they would actually bring that to you. And that's part of your room and board. Um, yeah, I'm totally down for that. That's fine. <laughs> I will be in a closed brothel if it's set up well. Yeah. Yeah, not not so that's the, that was the difference and I was going to ask you that so when they had like junk food did you find yourself being like fuck this I'm going to go out and get my own food and stock your fridge up or 
I, I mean, I didn't have a car in Nevada. I don't, I don't live in Nevada either. Um, gotcha. So it if was you did a have a car, of, if you did have a car, is it true? Sorry to ask a quick question, but if yeah. you did have a car, is it true that you'd have to license that with the sheriff as well? You'd have to let them know like what your car, car. No, no, no. Um, you wouldn't have to do that. Um, that I know of. Um, but um, again, you wouldn't really be able to leave if you were on shift. Sure, um, on your 12 hours, but yeah, gotcha. Oh yeah, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. You can't be like at lunchtime. If it's during your 12 hours, you can't be like, fuck this noise. I'm going to McDonald's. Like, <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and also all of the state of Nevada, the brothels have to be outside of a city. So you're in the middle of BFE. Yeah, really um, rural area. Yeah, so like Postmates didn't deliver there. Um, Go Fresh didn't deliver there. Grubhub would deliver there, but you better order early because uh, there's nothing going to be open that's within distance. And then, of course, you've got all their fees and everything. So if you want to order, uh, it was really best. Um, we would uh, find out if the driver, because there was always a driver, almost always a driver available and so we would just be like hey i'm gonna order some taco bell does anybody want taco bell and we'd all put in on the order and all of us tip the driver to go pick us up some taco bell um that was usually how that went gotcha interesting um, or we would make a weekly walmart run sure um which is you know that's another way they nickel and dime you um because you have to pay for those runs you have to you have to pay for any time you use the driver. Um, oh, I th I thought the driver was complimentary. What do you pay? The, the driver is complimentary for the guest. The car. You have to pay the gas. Uh, we had to pay the driver if we wanted to go somewhere. So like they tell you when when you get hired on there, they're like, we'll even pick you up from the from the airport. They will, but they are going to charge you forty dollars for that ride. Um, when I went in January, uh, they waited until I was already boarding the plane to let me know that they did not have a driver to pick me up and I had to get my own way there. And I'm still bitter about that because that was $120 to get from the airport all the way out there, which they never bothered to reimburse me for. So um, after that, I didn't complain so much about the $40 to the driver, uh, $12 to get to Walmart, um, but they would charge you, you know, if you went to more than one place, it would raise. What, what was the rate? Um, I, I don't even remember. I know it was like $12 for one. If you're going to one place, it's $12. But, but is it? any any place like does it matter the distance um i think it would matter the distance like if i was sure. gonna go all the way to reno sure from you know then that was a 40 dollar run because we would fly into reno to get to carson city so yeah um if you're just going into carson city for like walmart doesn't matter uh is a 12 dollar run so did nobody have a car adds up. Yeah, yeah, there was girls that had cars. There's girls that live close enough that they would just drive, um, you know, but I didn't have a car there because I don't live there. Yeah. My car is sitting out there. <laughs> yeah. So I live too far away for that mess. And I promise we'll get to the positives, but I want to, again, in the, the spirit of trying to make this a better industry, I want to just dig into this a little bit. So, um, I wanted to ask you, um, unless you had any other thoughts on transportation and the way they nickel and dime you, um, are there any other ways you feel like it's kind of like cheap, kind of getting the raw end of the deal? Like, how about your living situation or the wall, the walls thin as fuck and you just hear people fucking all the time in the room next oh, to you? Like I mean, it's like, it's like a bunch of mobile homes thrown together. Um, you know, they try and make it look fancy, but if you were to turn the lights all the way up in the parlor, um, especially the one we were at, uh, the couches have been there probably since 1991. 
Um, the edges on all the couches are worn, uh, stuffing coming out. The carpet had, I literally almost tripped one day because my heel got stuck in the carpet. Um, it's just poorly put together, um, very dated. You'd think they'd uh, make enough money. Yeah, to care about that. Uh, I mean, we had a jacuzzi room that you couldn't even use. It was out of order. And they're like, yeah, we can't afford to fix it. And we can't bust. They'd have to bust down a wall, I guess, to to change that up. So um, I don't know. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. It could. There were definite improvements that could be made. Uh, we We would often tell them um i know me and tori alone um we have you know quite a quite a bit of experience in bdsm um i know several of the houses have actual bdsm rooms um we begged for one we even offered to chip in and buy our own furniture if they would give us a room for it and they just didn't see the appeal of it so um there are plenty of ways that they're they're missing out you know yeah i mean in that case you should, you should have been like dude you understand i could charge this oh, much money for this we and people it, are asking so we all were the time blue, we were blue in the face telling them that um okay. because it's a, a fetish party you know yeah. um how much extra could we be making if we could offer you know the capabilities that we had, but I I digress. <laughs> sure. Um, so if you are if you can't think of anything else on like nickel and diming or short end of the stick, I can I have like that like a suggestion that I think might that might make the industry better. But again, I just want to give you space. Is there anything yeah. else you can think? No, about go on this? go for it. So you mentioned that you're tested weekly and a lot of people use that. I mean, I think you mentioned, I've, I feel like I've read your article because believe it or not, I discovered you, I found your Reddit. That's how I discovered you. Um, so I believe I have, I have read your article and what I believe what your article says about STDs is that they're nearly non, -ex they are non-existent now like nowadays at least because of oh, the yeah. measures that that you all take which again uh, you didn't explain it earlier the dick check can you give me a rundown of the dick check what what is that so is that? a dick check is just we have to do a visual inspection of the area before we're allowed to book so you would go into a room um to discuss um and and uh, negotiate the pricing um, when we would agree upon what price I'm willing to do, what you're asking me to do, uh, the next step is, okay, pull them down. Um, we keep alcohol wipes in a drawer next to the bed. And we would take those alcohol wipes and run them along the shaft, pull around any hair, um, visually check for any open wounds, any warts, any um, physical um, demonstration of an STD. Uh, I al always would pull the head back a little bit to make sure that there's no infection going on. Um, and I have seen people turned away. Like I've never had to turn a guest away, but I have seen it happen because, you know, I'm sorry you didn't pass my dick check. Um, it did not make me feel comfortable being exposed to this area of skin because even, even with a condom, um, there are STDs that can be transmitted. Um, so the dick check gives us the opportunity to visually see the area and make sure that there's nothing of concern that we can see. Yeah. So in the spirit of that, or with like with that in mind, um, I, my suggestion that I was alluding to earlier would be, and I, I didn't come up with this. I read this online because um, I never really thought about this way. Um, 
I never thought about it this way. Sorry, I realized I missed a word there. Um, <laughs> the sex workers are tested weekly, which is great. And a lot of people use that as a, you know, a, a pro, a, a good thing about the legal sex industry that those checks are in place. People pointed out that the customers are not tested for sexually transmitted diseases. I know you do the dick check, but they're not tested. Um, and they're also not, they don't have a criminal background check like you do too. And I don't know that the criminal background check is necessary. Like, I don't think that just because you have an offense that you, you that you're not, you don't get the privilege of, of experiencing a sexual experience or whatever. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm just trying to say when it comes to equal footing, it seems like the precautions are there to protect the customer more than the sex worker. Cause like you said, uh, a sexually transmitted disease can still pass through a condom. So maybe the better way would be to test also the customer. Um, there is not currently a feasible way to do that. Um, our testing would occur on Wednesday. We wouldn't get our results until late Thursday. So uh, if they were to come up with an automatic finger prick test that would tell us everything we need to know about their uh, STD status, then maybe in the future that might be a, a plausible idea. Um, it's just not plausible. Um, a lot of the reason it flourishes in sex work is because there is anonymity. Um, that's why, you know, and there, there have been discussions that I've had with girls about, you know, how can we keep being safe? How can we be safe um, from sexual predators, from violent men? Um, there is certain level of protection in a brothel from that. It's not a perfect system. Um, and there were times that we had unsafe people come in and we had to escort them out. And it was, you know, uncomfortable. Um, but there's not really a way to do that that doesn't hinder the business itself. It's just not a plausible thing. It is a risk, an inherent risk that you take when you offer your body for sale. And I feel like we do everything that we can to protect ourselves and to make sure, you know, that we are staying safe, but ultimately we are gambling uh, with our personal safety when we work in the sex industry. Yeah. It's an inherent uh, hazard of the business. It just is. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. And, you know, adults should be allowed to engage in risks in these country, in this country, especially if they know the risks. Like I've been floating around with the idea of parachuting. I know it sounds crazy and I don't fucking feel like I can do it, but I have the right to do it. And I think I'm going to. You Try know. it. Go for it. Yeah. If not? you if you want to do it and it doesn't hurt another person, exactly. I feel so, like we should be allowed to do it. Um, right. Free will, you know. Yeah. They like to preach it, but they don't really believe in it. <laughs> yeah. As far as free will goes, it sounds like you had a pretty good, like you were able to make decisions yourself. Um, have you heard of people not having that leeway? of being a quote unquote like you know you they say you're an independent contractor uh i just feel like again there's a lot of room for abuse in this industry and i have an idea to improve that too we'll get to that but have you heard of any you can't say no type of things um i honestly haven't um i do feel like um generally that's a pretty well respected rule um no means that you no. You can say no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No means no. If you become uncomfortable in a situation, by all means, in the party. Um, I haven't um, had to deal with anybody at the the place that I worked 
ever making me feel bad for turning anybody down. Of course, um, there is a certain amount of, well, you're walking a lot of people. Well, you know, you're not, you know, um, why did you turn all these people away? There's, there's some shame given to not taking low um, price parties. Um, but it's still ultimately, I don't have to take it if I don't want to. Yeah. You know? So. So, yeah, I, I was going to ask about low priced parties and I've even heard um, some in my research, some le legal sex worker said, if you want to make a brothel mad, ask them for their house minimum. Would, do you agree with that statement? And can you explain that maybe for people that don't know what I'm talking about? Um, so, you know, they do have house minimums, um, which I, I'm okay with that because I, I feel like it's honestly, you're wasting your time. If you are if you don't have a ballpark, do, if you don't yeah. have like a ballpark of what, yeah. yeah. And that's always something that you can blame on the house, you know, when they come in under that, um, you know, I had many times, um, where I would have somebody come in and I would go take them to negotiations and they would offer me a, a ridiculous amount. And I'm like, absolutely not. And they're like, what can I get for that? And I'm like, you can give that to me as a tip. And then you can walk back to the parlor because I'm not, I'm not willing to engage with you any further than we're already engaging. Um, and I oftentimes would just blame the house. You know, they have a minimum. I can't accept that for anything in return other than a tip. Um, so it, it works in your favor and then it, it doesn't. Um, but you always have to have in the back of your mind that you're only getting half of that if you're right. lucky. Right. I have so many tickets uh, where, you know, they, they take off, you know, multiple days of room and board because you didn't book for four days. So then you've got one big party and automatically they take half and then they take room and board for four days and then they take you know your doctor and then they take oh you know whatever and so i had one party my last trip where i literally walked away with five dollars and i was like you know <laughs> this is bullshit that yeah that doesn't that doesn't seem right at all you had you had sex with somebody and you walked away with five dollars five dollars so you know you have to just tell yourself well at least i don't i'm not in debt to the house anymore but then uh, so okay that's another thing you, you're in debt to the house so you have to make sure that you are bringing in a certain amount is that you arrive in debt to the house so um you know, it's, it's the same with any, any industry I've been in, in sex work. Um, you have somebody's thumb over what you're making. Um, and I don't think a lot of guests really think about these things because, you know, I've had a couple where they're like, well, I have all of this and I, I'm going to give you, and it's a lot of money. And you want to say, yeah, it is, you know, that's a good amount of money and I get it, but I'm not even going to see half of it. So I want to, to increase my profit and my profit is not even 50%. Can you tell me like what, like, I know that since, you, well, since you're not a, you're not a legal sex worker right now and we've not talked about where you were, um, can you tell me an amount that was like a common amount that was often thrown around as a good amount, but was actually offensive? I mean, um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, about a grand. So, so yeah, people are like, wow, you know, I'm giving you a thousand, but mm -hmm. when you're talking half of it goes to the house and then, then what else is there more, more that comes and then, out I of mean, it you have to pay, you have to pay your driver fees. If you have driver fees and you put them on your book. Um, so you they don't pay, pay those driver fees? Or well, I guess they do, but you, they take it out of your thing. I mean, they pay the drivers an hourly wage. So the drivers are making an hourly wage. Plus, you know, of course we're going to tip them. 
Um, I loved my drivers. Um, the drivers were great. So I would always tip them too, but um, it's, yeah. But I, my point is it doesn't seem like you should be tipping them. It seems like the, the, the customer should be tipping the driver, you know? Well, I mean, uh, if I were to go on an out date with a guest and one of our drivers, absolutely. Uh, I would make sure that the, the driver gets tipped from the client that I'm with. But if I'm just using the driver for my own personal errand. Okay. I am following you. Sorry. I yeah. misunderstood you. I thought you were talking about when you're with people that you have to pay for their driver. Like if they're like, I want to go to the, I want to go to Vegas with you. And then, and then you have oh. to pay for the driver. I was oh, like, no, what? no, no. Um, no, they, you would, you would price them in a way that you could pay those things because that yeah. is a charge that you get charged. So you would price it in a way that it covers those fees. Um, but I'm talking like when you first get there, for example, um, you're flying in, it's your first time, right? So you buy your plane tickets and you fly there and then they have a driver pick you up but they're gonna take that out of your first party. And uh, your fee from the, the sheriff's office, um, they'll tell you, you know, we'll put that on your book. So you don't have to pay that upfront, but that's also going on on your first party. Um, so you're in debt to that is what you're saying. So you're, oh yeah, you start out in debt because now yep, you've yep. got, uh, they'll tell you to get there on Tuesday, make sure you're there fly in on Tuesday because you got a doctor on Wednesday. So now you have room and board for Tuesday and Wednesday, which are two days that you can't work. So, you know, that's off the top. Your first time that you um, go to the doctor is a blood draw and a pap smear. Um, weekly, they do pap smears every week, but they only do blood draws once a month. So every four weeks you get the blood draw. Uh, I believe the last time those, those fees went up too. So it was like $160 off the top. So they're gonna, you know, your first party, they're going to take half. And then they're going to take that driver fee from Reno, which was $40. They're going to take your room and board for the last three days, four days, whatever that is. They're going to take your licensing fee that you paid for the sheriff's office, which I believe is $80. Um, so yeah, your, your first parties, they're, they're going to be wiped out. And so, and they'll prepare you for that. You know, the, yeah. your big sister is going to tell you, just go ahead and take those small parties because those will knock out your fees that you have to pay. Um, my thing with the small parties is I I will do a small party, but you're not going to get much. You know, you get what you pay for. And so there were a lot of times where uh, I would do, I would do small parties just to knock my fees out. But, you know, they're not touching me. They're definitely not kissing me. They're definitely, you know, not getting the oohs and ahs and I'm not going to even pretend like I'm enjoying it. So afterwards, sometimes they'd be like, well, you know, I was expecting fireworks and, and I'm like, you don't get fireworks for, you know, the minimum. And I warn them, you know, are you sure you can't come up at all? Because I want to make this an enjoyable experience and I do love doing it. I love my job. I love having sex. It's, fun. Uh, I enjoy having stranger sex. I'm kinky as fuck. Um, but you're looming all of these like debts over my head. So let's get in and get, get out so that I can pay these debts down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would get that. I, so that's, that's just nuts. I mean, I, I look, I get that at the end of the day, the job can be rewarding and i still want to give you space to talk about that but just let's dig in on this just a little bit longer you you how do you come out of a party making five dollars and can i ask you for details of what that party included so um as as far as details go um i can say um that was a day um that i had 
uh, it was my first party back and I was already in debt for the house. So um, I knew that they were going to take extra, you know, and it's just one of those, you don't want to try and push the, the client far enough to where they change their mind and decide, oh, this is too expensive. I can't do this. Um, and you want to clear those debts. So um, I will say that that guest that I dealt with that day, super nice guy. Um, I enjoyed my time with him. He was a gentleman. Um, he was so sweet, um, an older gentleman. Um, and I, I felt in that situation, you have to try and find the silver lining because you know already going in, I'm not making anything off of this. So that's when you just kind of have to find that silver lining. And I did. I enjoyed his company. He was a gentleman. He was nice to me. Um, and, and we had a good time. I had a good time with him. So um, do we do that in the free world? Do we have sex with people for a cocktail drink? I've done that. And I've walked away with less um, satisfactory sex than I had that day. So chalk it up to that. I mean, to, to folks that are critics of, of this movement, though, that's, that's probably one of the, I've heard, you know, some things that make me wish for better working conditions, but I think that's probably the craziest thing that I've that, that I've continually heard. Yeah. Those don't seem like good working conditions. Um, well, I mean, and the, the nickel and diming, um, it, it can really drag you down in your morale. Um, but you have to, you cannot be weak and be in sex work. You can't. It's, I've seen girls that were weak and it eats you alive. And it's not for everybody. Everybody thinks that, oh, this is the easiest job on earth. Um, you know, all you have to do is just open your legs and it's just so easy. It is the hardest job I've ever had. Um, can it be the most rewarding? Absolutely. Um, I've had times where, you know, it absolutely made up for days where it was a $5 day. Absolutely made it worthwhile. Um, so. Do I let days like that drag me down? Do I sit there and and freak myself out over thinking that? No, you have to put everything in perspective. It's like I said, um, how many times have I had sex for free and had an absolutely horrendous time? I could tell you stories. <laughs> I could absolutely tell you amazing stories of awful sex that I've had for free. And you're, um, to clarify, you're talking outside of the legal industry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, on yeah. my own, horrible experiences. I, I mean, I've been having sex for over 20 years. Like, I have stories. Sure. So, <laughs> um, you know, you, you just have to take the good with the bad, and you have to weigh them. Yeah. You know? But you have to do that in any industry you work in. Are there other industries that you absolutely pay with your body? Absolutely. Sure. Um, cashiers that aren't allowed to sit down for 12 hours a day while they stand in one place. That's absurd. We're the only country in the world where capitalism has taken it to such an extreme that we have to do things in an uncomfortable fashion because they think that that makes it more worthwhile for their bottom dollar. It, it's unfathomable to me. Um, and so, you know, when people tell me, oh, well, you're selling your body, so are you. You're selling your body if you work on an oil rig. You're breaking your back in, in, when you're sweating over, you know, doing construction. We all sell our body in different ways. So, um, you know, it's just like any other industry. There's good and there's bad. Yeah. And you just have to weigh it for yourself. Yeah. Um, 
so one last question and then we can talk about the the good um you know maybe some of the positive experiences i think there's a reason you're still a proponent um so uh i wanted to ask because because tori mentioned that she does uh she takes it very seriously that she does not reveal the um like identities of the folks that she works with um it sounded like though she did that out of like a personal personal you know just trying to respect you know um is that a requirement is my question like is there privacy laws for customers i mean maybe it's an unwritten rule um you're not going to get very far in the industry if you're not discreet i do know that um you know men like their privacy a lot of those men that come in there you know they're they're maybe on a business trip they're married um you know i had a few of them um tell me you know does this bother you i don't need to know i don't need to know you're a transaction this is transactional there's no emotion involved here um do i care about the the guests that i saw absolutely um i'm a very empathetic person um i can empathize with the man that's sitting in front of me and asking me to do this thing um th that takes some vulnerability and i understand that and i respect that um so you know do i want to sit and tell all of these stories about you know oh well this guy did this and this guy did that no um will i talk about things in an anonymous fashion yeah i will um maybe a little more than tori does um because i think i have some fun stories but um the bottom line is i i respect the gentleman that i've spent time with um I, I think about a lot of them. I still do, even though I'm probably never going to talk to this, this one guy that's in my head. I had a good time with him and he was a gentleman to me. And, you know, I think about the gentleman that I, I talked to that, you know, his wife had passed away and he hadn't touched another woman in a long time. And I was the person he was coming to, to be vulnerable with. Um, I respect that. And I feel like it takes a lot of courage to hire a sex worker. Um, it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable with another human. And I am very blessed to be in the industry that allowed me that, um, that moment in time with another human. Were there shitty ones? Absolutely. Ones that I hope I never speak to again, ones that I you know, could care less about. Um, but for the majority of them, really great men that were respectful, that I would love to spend more time with. But yeah, I definitely, um, I don't think that it's necessarily a law anywhere, but it's the nature of the business is anonymity, um, discreet um, contact. That's just how it is. Yeah. So I was reading that licenses haven't been issued since like the seventies and there are only 21 active brothels. Do you think it would be a better thing? Cause like Tori floated the idea, like, I wish I could, she said, I wish I could like open up my own brothel and, you know, have a, ma have some male sex workers. Cause that's something that's, that, that would be in demand and that I would apply for. And no, I'm just joking. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, she was saying, you know, open up her own brothel. Uh, she did say the she did say the male sex worker thing. I wasn't joking about that. I just slid a little joke in there about myself. But um, and then um, you know, she just talked about how if that were the case, since you know, like it would be a brothel run by sex workers, that it would be overall a better working environment because, you know, uh, like I don't know. I just have seen some of the brothel owners and they don't strike me as sex workers. They look, I'm sorry, but they just look more like literal pimps. Like, like the, well, I'm thinking of one specifically that was always smoking a cigar, big ball oh, yeah. dude, you know, he looked like a pimp and I heard he acted like one, um, you know, so. Uh, I mean, and, and this is my knowledge of the gentleman that you're talking about. Um, I worked with a lot of girls that knew him and worked for him. And I feel like 
um, his business model was brilliant. He was a, he was a brilliant marketer. Um, if he were around right now, I feel like his businesses would be flourishing. Um, whereas I don't feel like the people put in place have the first idea of how to do anything remotely close to what he did. Um, he was from what I've seen from the outside, um, you know, I've only seen the show that he did, um, personally. Um, he definitely feels like every strip club manager I ever had. <laughs> um, they are, they're, they're all old white guys that are pervs. You can't be in that industry and not be some sort of a perv. Um, you know, I come from a, a place where they speak very highly of him. Um, although, you know, I did know a, a few girls that knew Ron Jeremy and you still can't say shit about Ron Jeremy in front of them because they will freak out. And I'm literally sitting here going, dude's in jail. Like he actually, he did these things. Like, yeah. don't tell Ron me he's a great guy. Clearly he wasn't a great guy. Well, it's and it's crazy because Ron Jeremy is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the person that found uh, the person we're talking about dead. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's the story. He's the one who uh, found. I, I maybe don't know. It's, to, maybe to it's internet it's lore. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's exactly. Lore lore. I want to be very clear <laughs> right now that, again, I am not an investigative journalist. I'm just trying to figure things out. So I did a little bit more research on this specific thing that I thought I recalled, and I recalled correctly. Let's take a look at this first newscast, which does confirm that Ron Jeremy was the person to find uh, the body of Dennis Hoff, which is who we were referring to in this clip. Let's take a first uh, – let's take a look at this clip first. Uh, which is admittedly a bit, it feels a bit sensationalist. You'll notice the music in the background and everything else. Uh, but it mentions a few people that I think will be helpful to know their names for the next clip that I'm about to share. And I actually have a story uh, related to somebody that's featured in these clips So uh, that, that I actually interacted with uh, during the course of making this show. First off, let's watch this video, which confirms... Uh, the rumor that I basically was floating just a moment ago. Dennis Hoff dead. The owner of the infamous Nevada Bunny Ranch brothel was found by longtime friend, porn star Ron Jeremy. All this just hours after celebrating the pimp's 72nd birthday. His skin felt a little cold. And then uh, when I tried to move his arm gently, it wouldn't go. Ron Jeremy explains how he discovered Dennis Hoff's lifeless body in a room at the Love Ranch South in Crystal, Nevada. The porn actor and the 72-year-old businessman were at a political rally and then partying together Monday night before Hoff went to his room with prostitute Dasha Dare. That was the last time he was seen. When Hoff didn't show up the next morning for a scheduled event, Jeremy knew something was wrong. He's very responsible. If he's at a gig, he's going to show up at the gig. And now it's time's going by, and it's really uncomfortably going by. Hoff was the well-known owner of seven legal brothels in Nevada. We sell the adventure because sometimes the travel is as good as the destination. He died in the same suite. Basketball player and Khloe Kardashian's ex, Lamar Odom, overdosed in 2015. Hoff's death comes as a shock to Jeremy, telling DailyMail.com, Dennis was in great spirits and told me it was the best night of his life. Notorious Hollywood madam and Hoff's longtime domestic partner, Heidi Fleiss, can't believe he's gone. We just talked as friends about plans of the future. Senior correspondent Tara Burney joins us now. And Tara, Hoff was running for Nevada State Assembly. So what happens in the election now? Well, he was an unlikely candidate. He was a conservative, he was a Republican, and he was back, he backed Donald Trump. He even joked that he went from pimping to politics. Mm. And he just recently won the primary, like you said, in the state's assembly race earlier this month. And his name will actually stay on the ballot come election day. And what they'll do is they'll put a notice of death at the voting polls and uh, people will make their choice from there. Okay, we should mention an autopsy will be done to determine the cause of Hoff's death as well. Tara, thank you so much for the update. And so um, Dasha Dare, who was mentioned in that 
episode, I found a, a video of that I will be able to share. Um, because as you would imagine, since she was the last person to see him alive, some rumors kind of floated around. So, you know, we will uh share the video that I found with regard to that. Let's take a look at one more video here, and then I can tell you the person that I interacted with through the course of this uh, series here. Let's take a look at this other report of Ron Jeremy and Heidi Fleiss finding uh, or reacting to the death of Dennis Hoff. Yeah, this guy, they've been my friend for 25 years. And actually, I just wanted to mention really quick, the report that we just watched mentioned that he would be uh, still listed on the election ballot. And I just wanted to let you know that uh, he actually did get elected posthumously. So um, I will just share this article really quick from the New York Times, this headline, Dead Pimp. Dennis Hoff cruises to victory in Nevada state election. So he won the election po uh, posthumously, I believe is the correct term. So um, even though he was a dead pimp, he was elected in Nevada. So here's this last clip that I wanted to show you. And then I will tell you about uh, the person who I interacted with. I'll tease it. It was Heidi Fleiss. I'll tell you about our interaction in just a moment. Yeah, this guy had been my friend for 25 years on the bed, you know, stiff, you know, cold, eyes at half mass. It's like, what the heck? What? You know, I leave for 10 minutes. You know, it was just, it was so weird. I think it was he, a heart attack. His, he had diabetes and his diet was poor. And I was making references to, was it Nelson Rockefeller? Same thing happened. Just a note here, this person that's standing behind Heidi, his name was Zach. When he died in the sack, I think. This is the yeah. one strange thing that Dasha says when she left him that he had a t-shirt and boxers on. And that when they found him that he was naked. He used to brag that he could go on and on and on. And then and he would say like how many times he do it in an hour. Saying, Dennis, that beats me. I can't do that. You gotta you gotta stop that. He may be Really quick, if you noticed, Heidi Fleiss just made a comment. She said the only weird thing that stuck stood out to her was uh, something about Dasha. So I mentioned Dasha earlier. Once again, I've got a news clip uh, that I found that that I will share where uh, some rumors, you know, circulated about Dasha, which she uh, ended up denying from what I recall. Uh, but just stay tuned. We'll share that video in the future. I just want to I pull the video back so that maybe you can hear that again. I think. This is the one strange thing that Dasha says when she left him that he had a t-shirt and boxers on and that when they found him that he was naked. He used to brag that he could go on and on and on and then and he would say like how many times he do it in an hour saying Dennis that beats me I can't do that you gotta you gotta stop that. He may sh shoot a, a, a lightning bolt in my face for saying this but I, he he was monogamous would, geographically. Yeah he actually could be <laughs> that you know, makes he sense. wasn't involved in a relationship. <laughs> we just he, talked his about relationship was like most people it wasn't wild and crazy. Yeah. People just love the living the daylight side of the guy. Right now as we speak uh, you got Flavor Flav crying his eyes out, you know, and I never heard Flavor Flav cry his eyes out. I'd say uh, he couldn't, Dennis could not have been happier. When I arrived Sunday at his house, he said, Heidi, that was the best party we've ever greatest had. Greatest night of my life, he greatest said. Greatest night of my life. All these political people, all, all these uh, guys that are in government, shook his hands, put their arms around him, said, we're going to get this, we're going to get this. He was so happy. I think, so I don't know how I honest, the heck, yeah. you know, that happiness gets turned to dying doesn't know how the heck that happiness gets turned to dying. So um, I believe that Dennis, the, 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 uh, what's it called? The coroner's report, the obituary, not the obituary, the, whatever the co his cause of death was released. Uh, we can release that in the future. If I can find it, I can. So right now I am sharing what appears to be the uh, record of examination by the Clark County Coroner for Dennis Hoff. You can see the name there, Dennis Hoff. Um, cause of death, acute myo myocardial infraction due to ater 
me. I don't know what the fuck that says. Something about hypertensive cardiovascular disease. Other significant conditions, as um, Heidi Fleiss mentioned, d- diabetes. Looks like melanitis. Mel- melit- I don't know what the fuck that says. Obesity. And um, yeah, this is the, uh, from what I understand, the coroner's report for Dennis Hoff's death. I did not realize that if I scrolled a little bit lower on this report that that uh, it's it's a bit easier to read. So first of all, interestingly, uh, his toxicology, um, they did find Delta 9 THC and its metabolites, 11 hydroxy, Delta 9 THC and Delta 9 carboxy. Uh, so THC was detected, uh, sildenafil and it's a metabolite in Desmond. I don't even know was detected, um, non-toxic levels of arsenic, selenium, and lead were detected. Caffeine was detected, gamma hydroxy butric acid, cyanide, alindrin, and swainos. I don't even they're not detected. Anyways, though, to move on, uh, there's a there's an opinion piece which talks about, you know, according to the investigative information provided, this 72-year-old man was celebrating his birthday with friends on the night of October 15th, 2018. He returned to a local brothel, which he owned with friends at approximately 2,300 hours and went into a bedroom with a female employee. She left the room at 50. I'm guessing that's... Uh, 1250. I don't know military time, people. Um, I feel so stupid. Um, anyways, though, once again, toxicological testing detected Delta 9 THC in his body, but this is what I was having trouble uh reading earlier with handwriting. I'm gonna have trouble reading it again because they're really big words. So that's why I'm displaying it on the screen so that any health professionals that know how to actually pronounce these words can laugh at me right now. So the cause of death is acute myocardial infarction due to the atherosclerotic and hypertensive cardiovascular disease with diabetes mellitus and obesity included as other significant conditions the manner of the death is natural so once again manner of death natural cause of death those big words 328 2019 it looks like christina d loretto was the forensic pathologist uh, for this coroner's report but really quick i told you that i interacted with heidi fleiss let's take a look at that interaction what i can show you of that interaction so um i asked heidi if she'd be willing to speak to me um in october of 2022 you can actually see that here i said you can see a little bit of my message that i sent And I said, meant to send this along in my original message. I also recently interviewed some of the chefs that cooked for you for Dennis's birthday, which is the night that he died. So I interviewed this chef here that cooked for him the night that he died. Uh, I believe this was maybe the year before that happened. Um, But stay tuned. That's the chef. And this chef was very good friends with Zach, who also died shortly after Dennis Hoff's death. Um, so uh, I say shortly after, I, I don't remember exactly the timing, but the point is he died following uh, Dennis Hoff's death. There's Heidi Fleiss, of course, which is why I sent this picture. And after a year, so again, I sent this message on 10 2022, randomly on September 27th. 2023 she sent me this picture and and that's it and if you know anything about Heidi Fleiss she's a big fan of birds and fun fact you may not have known about about me but so am I so um I was gonna share a picture of me with birds and and a video with me with birds but I'm not gonna do that um long story short Heidi Fleiss was a bit too busy to connect at the time. Um, but she said, you know, to, that she'd keep me in mind in the future. And 
I honestly just found it weird that she responded me responded to me a year later. I, I you know again I sent that message on October 29th, two thousand and twenty two, and she responded at six forty nine in the six forty nine a.m. Central Time. Mind you, that is four or three a.m. where she lives in Nevada. I might be wrong on the timing there, but the point is it's early. So and she sent me that picture of a bird. And then we had a small conversation after that that I don't necessarily want to share. Um, anyways, I wanted to just confirm that little rumor that I floated during the show because I can. And enjoy the rest of the episode. And I I am I I would consider myself an advocate or you know a proponent of legal sex work. And so when I hear these things just through random Googlings they like worry me because because nevada is the only place in the united states that's doing this and it's such a small market and they're all in these rural counties it just like i said it's it seemed like it was ripe for abuse and then when i was able to find easy claims of bad working conditions it just became very concerning so well i feel like you know when something like this becomes legal um, and this maybe is a phenomenon based solely in our country, um, is that they'll legalize something, but then um, there's constant battles trying to make it illegal again. Um, that's yeah. one of the reasons maybe that there hasn't been recent licensing, that you know they make it so impossible um, for you to own one um, that their roadblocks, they think these roadblocks are making it safer or making it better because they're putting up all of these roadblocks so new businesses can't open. But what they're really doing is they're they're giving the bad guys that have all the money the space to do what they want. You know, um, it's like I said, it's it's so interchangeable in sex industries. Um, I can tell you about my hometown um where i started stripping in my hometown there was um i believe there was three strip clubs in town and then they had the ordinance where if it was fully nude it had to be outside of city limits so just topless clubs in town i worked in all three of them at some point or another then city council passed a rule where if um the strip club closed for any reason for longer than, I think it was like 30 days. If it was closed down for longer than 30 days, it couldn't reopen as a strip club. Um, and so at some point they started going after one of the strip clubs and they'd close down the kitchen. Oh, well, you can't be open. We need to close you down. Um, the building safety needs to be closed down. And they did it so strategically that now there's no strip clubs open in my hometown. Who does that hurt? That hurts the girls that are making money because having to deal with the bad owners, having to deal with um, poor working conditions, it's worth it to an extent and you put up with it to an extent because the money is better than flipping burgers. The, the hours are better than that. You know what I mean? Um, there's, there's always a change off, which makes it worth it. Um, so when they come through and they try and um, wrestle away the rights to be open in the rural counties, certain counties have passed laws saying, we can't, we don't want any more brothels. We have enough. Those really hinder anything greater happening. So when we put lawmakers in charge um, that don't have our interests at heart, you know, representatives that don't take sex workers that are in their districts, they don't take them seriously. They don't listen to them. Um, those are the things that hurt the girls ultimately. Um, I don't feel like enough um, enough people that care about these things vote. I feel like people have become apathetic to it. 
and they don't take those things into account. And so then they don't vote for the people that will actually represent our best interests. Do you think enough people are talking about this though? Because like in my internet research, I can, it's, it's like, you know, you can find some things, but most of the things you can find, like, especially all the content that comes from brothels, like from the girls that, that are actively in brothels, you can definitely tell the content is curated by the brothel. Like you were saying earlier, like they're, they're only strictly business. Um, well, but a lot of that too is and curated. I get that. It's curated by the nature of the business because um, I can't post a lot of things in in my persona of May, December. Um, And I do post some political stuff, but I generally stay away from a lot of heavy stuff. You stay away from the heavy stuff because it doesn't sell the stuff. Well, yeah, yeah. You don't want to (laughs) alienate your, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, so a lot of that is out of necessity. Um, if you know me in real life, then you have no question where my politics stand. And uh, I do, to a point, um, post it anyway, I guess, um, to a certain yeah, extent. You seem, you seem like you don't, to certain, for a certain extent, you seem like a fuck the system type of, type of woman. I am I say, very so much a, um, yeah. Um, I, I feel very strongly a certain way about certain types of people. Um, before I worked um, in, when I was not working in sex work specifically, um, I had some r- great fun stories about cuckolding certain um, types of voters, <laughs> uh, which I, I found great joy in, and I still do, love it. Um, but will I post those things? In a, in a forum where I'm trying to recruit clients for sex work? Probably not. Um, not I'm not going to alienate, um, you know, it, it's very similar to when I worked in hair. We don't talk politics, we don't talk religion in the shop. Um, and, and there were times where guests would start talking to me about stuff like that. And I'm like, I don't wanna know who you voted for. I wanna, I wanna like you. So yeah. you want to like me. I want to like you. You don't want to know my po- political stance on things. You start taking um, my pants off and I'm like, yes, yeah, so this last debate, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, unless, unless I got the vibe that the client that I was with, um, we shared sure. that thing. If I, if I knew that, you know, oh, I shared a political view with you. Absolutely. Let's sit here and talk politics and fuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's just even more fun for me. So, um, but a lot of times, yeah, it, it is curated by, you know, the house that you're working in. Everything needs to be light and fun and airy. Yeah. That's what they're going to you for. It's a fantasy. Yeah. They want the fantasy and you got to give it to them. Um, right. That hinders that movement a lot um i think that hinders it with any you know sex workers trying to unionize um because men don't want to think of us as having anything here when they're trying to get down there that's all they care about Um, brains don't turn them on yeah so you said the the good outweighs the bad i want to shift to that uh but but before we go i want to make it very clear that my comment or my question is about speculation or rumor have you heard anything you know now i'm asking about something you've not experienced but have you heard about anything that we've not talked about like i've personally heard about like like if you just if you look on the wikipedia page for prostitution in nevada um one of like the criticisms section there's a criticisms section they talk about like there's allegations of sex trafficking um of like basically you know corrupt relationships between the sheriff and the the owner of the brothel is kind of commonplace which by the way i don't know like if you i'm not i'm not expecting you to be an expert on this law, but I really feel like the the requirement for the brothel owner to work with the sheriff and for the sex workers to work with the sheriff 
is a holdover from the old days when you had to buy off the sheriff. I feel like it's like they just formalized that process legally. You know what I mean? I mean, you can look at that for any industry that you have to be licensed in. True. Uh, because, That's actually a good point. That's a good point. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's like weed. Cause like, I mean, with, with legal weed here in Illinois, uh, police exactly. can just stop. Weed, by is actually, grow. weed is actually, um, was my argument. Uh, whenever I first announced that I was going to work in a brothel, um, I had an ex of mine, um, send me all these articles that she found on online about sex trafficking in brothels. And she was so scared for me. And and I countered that with articles on sex trafficking in legal cannabis states, how that increased, um, increased. Um, they found that in um, states where legal weed was allowed, sex trafficking gr grew. Um, and there was some correlation with them trafficking people in to work, um, in the the fields collecting the cannabis and in the trimming and that they would um because you have to be licensed to do that uh at least where i was living in colorado um you know everything has to be licensed and you have to be licensed but they're trafficking in people to do it illegally and i was like you know um anytime you traffic somebody uh into an industry that was once guarded only by the black market, it's gonna, that's gonna happen. Um, but overall, legalizing something that is on the black market takes away that black market. And that's the statistics across the board. And that's for anything that is, is sold on the black market. Um, you're gonna find that if you, decriminalize it well decriminalizing needs to come with legalizing anything absolutely if you're going to legalize something you better decriminalize it at the same fucking time yeah. and that's just logic <laughs> um but if you're going to legalize something um you have to expect that there's some going to be some transition it's not yeah. you know so but i do feel like um putting a license on something um and having the government regulated, I don't see a problem with that because I would rather have to do that and have yeah. some sort of authority regulating the people that I have to deal with um, and making sure that my coworkers are being safe so that I'm safe. Um, you know, it's just like when I was doing hair, there's always been a lot of debate on should, should we take away licenses and just let people legally cut hair? Absolutely not. Um, we go through training to learn sanitation, to learn how not to um, contaminate, like there's bloodborne pathogen classes that we have to take. There's all sorts of things that you might know how to shave somebody's head properly, but do you know how to clean your um, supplies properly so that you don't give somebody scabies? Sure. Probably so, not. But, but with hair and with, with liquor and even in some states with cannabis in some states. Now I'm about to give you another parallel that you can use for cannabis. It's really easy to open and get involved in the industry and make your own money and be a self-starter. But in some states like Illinois, in Illinois, you know, here's actually a really interesting parallel. For the longest time, Illinois has only had 21 cultivation centers. You remember earlier I said there's only 21 brothels in Nevada? It's kind of interesting. Magic uh, number. Illinois <laughs> yeah, Illinois uh, has Chicago in the state, which is the third most populated city in the United States. Um, it's a pretty big state. And to think that, so here's my point. Uh, there's another parallel that you just pointed out. Like you said, generally speaking, if you legalize it, the black market will go away. But I'm trying to argue that maybe we could have legalized it better because- Absolutely. Because like with cannabis in Illinois and with legal sex work in Nevada, I've actually read that the black market or the gray market, I think it's commonly referred to in Nevada because it, it like these people do a good job. Like they do offer, like they've got, you know, professional ads, professional services, but they're just not professionally licensed. And so uh, technically speaking, what they're doing is illegal, but I've heard that those are actually more popular than the legal services um, in, in Nevada. Um, 
I mean, I don't know if it's totally true. That's just what I read online. I mean, in every place you have escorts. Sure. Um, That's true. Yeah. I mean, there's no, uh, as Tori said, like basically there's no, uh, no place is excluded from sex work. She's like your no. church parking lot, <laughs> wherever. There's sex work in every state of the union. Sure. Um, yeah. Is it is it legal sex work? No. Um, I want to preface this by saying I do not involve myself in illegal sex work. Um, I I am not brave enough um, to partake in that. It's very dangerous. Um, there's not a safe way to go about it. If there was a safe, safe enough way, I would probably do it. Um, I found the safety of a brothel uh, very appealing um, to do something that I always wanted to do. Um, I, I always wanted to try and do that because it's something that I enjoy. It's something that intrigues me. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to, to do it. And uh, I, I loved it. I loved my time there. Yeah, um, and I think that's a good, good segue. I wish you, I mean, that they would make it legal everywhere, um, and I feel like it's baby steps. But at the same time, I feel like there's so many forces trying to push it back and make it illegal that we're we're spinning our wheels and we're not perfecting the system. We're just trying to keep it open. I yeah, well said, very well said, um, and you know. I want to give you the room. We've talked a lot about the bad. It's in the spirit of making it better. Um, you you mentioned, you know, a lot of times your experience is the good outweighs the bad. You're 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 working better hours. You're making better money. Um, tell us more about the good. Like, what are some good experiences you've had? I'm sure you've had very positive experiences with people that haven't been able to be intimate. For example, uh, like you said, with either there was that one guy that you mentioned that hadn't been intimate with a woman for many years i'm sure there are other things i want to give you the space to talk about some positive experiences in the legal sex industry um yeah i i enjoyed a, a lot of aspects of of working out there um i loved being able to be a safe place for a vulnerable human um to feel wanted um we all have that need to have intimacy with somebody. And when somebody is denied any form of intimacy, it affects every aspect of their life. It affects their mental health. It affects um, the job that they do every day. Um, it can weigh very heavy on somebody and to be able to take that weight off of somebody, I can't really describe how that feels. Um, it, it feels like, you know, the best form of social work that I myself can offer somebody. Um, like when I, when I cut hair, um, a lot of times you end up being like a counselor to your guests. They're sitting in your chair, you become friends with them. Um, they tell you things that they don't tell other people. Um, they open up to you in ways like, like you're a therapist. And I used to love that about cutting hair. But then when I moved into sex work, it was like tenfold, um, my ability to do those things. Um, the one gentleman that I had that, you know, his wife had passed away many years before and he had never been comfortable dating. Um, he had attempted to a few times, but he always felt guilty because of his love for his wife. Um, was never faltering, but he had physical needs that weren't being met. He had not touched, like physically touched another woman um, in six years. And I spent several hours with this gentleman and it, the sex that was involved was a minute part of that. Most of the time we sat and just held each other. He melted into my arms and it was just that pure human connection. And I would not trade that experience for anything. It was amazing to me. Um, a lot of times, you know, we would get men that were, you know, they come in and they're so like embarrassed and like, oh, I don't want to, you know, 
to open myself up to you. I just want this to be a transaction and that's it. But then as soon as they get in there, it's so clearly more than just transactional sex. It's an emotional connection that you're making with another human being. And I've had men cry on my shoulder um, and tell me things that they might not have ever told another human being um, about themselves. And they felt they, they get themselves into this position where you are their counselor, you're, um, they're emotionally dumping on you. And, um, you know, that's part of what you sign up for. And that's part of what you charge for. Um, if they have like a lot of that, and there are some of them that come in and they do, like that's the majority of what they want from you. Um, I have heard of people being like sexual therapists where, um, you know, people that have like erectile dysfunction that are caused by certain anxieties or certain, you know, other mental issues that are holding them back from being able to sexually perform. Um, sex workers are really that bridge to be able to help you work through the sexual trauma that you experienced. Um, and there's specific sex workers that um, ca characterize themselves as, you know, a therapy. And I 100% believe in that. Um, I loved every opportunity I got that I was able to walk away and say, I helped this man. Like it wasn't just sex. And, and a lot of times they think like, that's all you're there for. It's just, you're just like a living, breathing sex doll, but you're, you're so much more when you're a sex worker. Um, because you, you really, there is a place in society for sex workers and people want to deny that, but it's the truth. Um, a very controversial, um, thing that I have noticed is, um, with pedophilia. Uh, even when I was a stripper, I had, I had a client, um, back in the early two thousands who was a registered sex offender. And I had conversations with him about um, how he kept himself out of trouble and kept himself from um, doing things that in his brain, his brain was telling him to do his attractions. And one of those was to go to strip clubs and find strippers that were willing to wear the schoolgirl uniforms and that looked younger and looked smaller. There's the same thing in sex work. There are sex workers that look underage and they're not. And that is a fine line, I get it. But in my head, and this is from working in and out of the industry in, in different aspects, um, would you rather that man go pay for a legal um, consenting adult um, to play that role? for them um, than offend, of course. Um, I feel like there's sociopaths, there's psychopaths that find outlets in that, which can totally turn the wrong way. Um, as you can see in illegal sex work, um, how many serial killers target sex workers? Um, when you put them in a, a cleaner, safer environment, that's a protection from them. Are they 100% safe from those people? No, I've met sexual predators that have come and thought, this is what I'm going to do here. No, you're not going to do it because I'm empowered to tell you no, and you have to leave. You're not going to treat me this way. Um, and I always would come back to, man, he's going to go find a, an illegal sex worker and abuse them, um, but not to get too heavy into that, just saying that there is a place in sex work um, that protects the rest of society. And I feel very strongly about that. And I feel like there needs, it's very similar to places that have made um, places for people to shoot up. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah, safe consumption lounges. I mean, yeah. frankly, bars are safe consumption lounges for alcohol. 
So very true. Very true. Um, I, I feel the same way for sex work. There needs to be safe consumption places for sex workers, um, for their protection. Yeah. Um, because those type of people are attracted to sex workers because they can pay for their needs to be met. And I'm perfectly okay with their needs being met in a cons consensual, safe manner for the workers. So um, I hope nothing that I've just said construes that I'm okay with pedophilia or I'm okay with abusing other people because absolutely not. I think that, it, it, no, there's not, but I am a realist. And so I, I feel like if we can do what we can as a society to allow sex workers space to do their job, uh, we'll have a safer environment. Um, I, I've also seen people that have disabilities um, that use sex workers um, to fulfill their needs because let's face it, there's a lot of those people that are, are not getting laid regularly. <laughs> um, they, aren't, they aren't good with the ladies on their own. Um, but do we, do we enjoy their company there? Absolutely. Um, Am I perfectly okay with somebody coming in having a disability? I would get messages all the time saying, you know, I have this issue. Like I can't just pick a girl up at the bar um, because she's not gonna wanna talk to me. You know, I have this thing going on physically. Um, you know, will I overlook that as a sex worker? Absolutely. Will I make you feel like a million bucks and like, I love every second I'm with you. Absolutely. And that's the point of my job. So like I said earlier, it takes um, a, a very strong woman in this job. It's not an easy job, but I do believe there are certain people that are great at this job. And, you know, I love doing it. I, I love being a part of that story for somebody. Gotcha. I hope all of that made sense. <laughs> yeah, no, it did. It did. And I am so appreciative of your time today because I don't feel like a lot of people are talking about this or enough people are talking about this. And I do believe, I do agree with you uh, that society would benefit. I mean, look, I look at it, I boil it down to this. It is simply a massage. Like, depending on how intimate it gets, yes, it becomes sexual intercourse. But if we're talking about like something like a hand job, like that's literally a massage. Like, you know, you can massage my shoulders, you can massage anything. So it's just crazy to me that it's not, so it's not criminal to do those things. It's cr criminal to have a transaction involving those things. Like God forbid, you know, somebody. Well, it, it depends on the transaction because True. you can pay me to have sex with you if we're recording it and selling the video. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> it's a, it's a weird system we live in. It's very weird. I didn't think, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the home porn, home videos are certainly a popular category and in, in the porn community Excuse well and you know i i do content so um if i want to do content with somebody i i run a group on facebook of um only fans collaborators people who hey you have an only fans i have an only fans let's do a video together perfectly legal i can absolutely do that and i'm not going to get in trouble for prostitution because I'm not a prostitute now. I'm a content creator. So do you, in that situation, have you done that first of all? Yeah, yeah, I and, have done that. So do you like just agree like, all right, I'm going to post this on my account and I'll be honest with you about how much we make and I'll give you half or like, how does that usually work out? No, generally when I do it, um, I either do it um, for like a, a solid payment which there's websites out there um, for small time porn. And 
there'll be ads that'll say, you know, I pay this much for a boy girl scene. I pay this much for an anal. I pay this much for a girl and girl, or I'll pay this much for solo. And I just videotape it and edit it. Um, me and Tori actually have a movie together that we did. Um, we both have um, rights to that video. She sells it. I don't know what she's selling it for, but I'm selling it. I got it up on my OnlyFans right now. And I'm actually doing a fundraiser for it um, on OnlyFans because you can do the fundraisers where once I get to this certain amount, I'm going to release this video. Um, and we market it differently. She'll put it up and then she'll take it down. I'll get tags for it. Um, and that's generally what it is, is just to promote each other, to help us grow new followers. Um, you know, I have a, a Pornhub account. I don't make anything off of my Pornhub account, but I just I just post little clips to get people to go to my pay sites or to buy content directly from me because uh, I do both um, selling stuff directly and, and selling stuff through my websites. So, um, yeah, it's it's funny to me that that little loophole um, and and there's there's certain rules, you know, that. I have for that to keep safe as well. I don't um, necessarily travel places to do it unless I know the people doing it. Um, I take an escort with me um, or I involve somebody in it that I trust. Um, and I, uh, I am registered on uh, talent testing services, which is what the major porn industry uses. Um, and I require anybody that I work with to be tested um, or I make them wear a condom. So um, those are, you know, the way that I stay safe outside of the brothel uh, because I, I like being um, safe. I hate using the word clean um, because I feel like that's a misnomer. STDs do not make you dirty. Um, almost everybody has some form of herpes. Um, so, you know, a disclaimer, I'm not saying that having an STD makes you dirty, um, but it, it does hinder you in this business. So staying STI negative is important, um, for my work. Well, it's like I say, it's been uh, a pleasure speaking to you. I think it's this, this whole topic is really fascinating. I think it'd be cool to sit down with you again in the future. I'm sure there's more to talk about uh, on this topic. Um, any, any last thoughts, last words, once again, folks that are listening, uh, we'll have May's uh, information in the show notes so that you can check out their social media, their only fans, everything May, December online. Um, May, uh, do you have any last thoughts or, or anything that, that we haven't touched on that you'd like to discuss before we break? Um, I am hoping to return to the brothels at some point. So, um, you know, I, I just wish that um, we could be the change that we want to see um, happen. And I hope that everybody who is listening gets out and votes and knows who they're voting for and becomes active because having apathy with our voting system is so easy, but it's so important, especially for us that have different mindsets about the norm. Yeah. Um, if you wanna change things, that's the first step. And the, the best way to do that is locally, wherever you live. Yeah. Um, what are the what are the politics like in Nevada? Like, do you, have you heard of or seen like people running on like, Hey, I'm going to run for sheriff. I won't mess with the brothels or, you know, they'll stay in town or like what, it, what are politics? Nevada, like in Nevada? Nevada was surprisingly red. It was, um, there's a lot of Trump supporters in Nevada and yeah. Uh, I didn't really get too involved in the politics there sure. because of that. Uh, I don't share the beliefs that I feel like. But does uh, a lot of like, them... le I mean, legal sex work is going on in a, in a red state. It surely, it's not a talking point. Um, I, 
there is like some lobbying going on there, trying to get it gone. Um, the evangelicals are really, really fighting um, for that. I feel like um, the run-of-the-mill Republicans, a lot of the the brothel owners, you know, they're rich people. Rich people tend to not care what the little people want. Um, so they just live in like this little loophole of, oh, sorry, my cat <laughs> jumped on me. Um, they live in this little loophole of wanting to be this conservative while still making their money off the backs of sex workers. It's, um, it's too common. It is too common. I mean, the person that we were talking about earlier, I've, I might be wrong, but I think he was one of them. Like he hung out with Trump or at least had associations with that's like such a cute cat. Folks, if you're not watching the video version of this podcast, you need to. Um, we've yeah. got a couple of cats, so it's no we're we're no stranger to cats visiting this podcast. Um, yeah. So so yeah. Anyways, like like I said, that person was elected posthumously. I heard. Uh, yeah, yeah, and you know, a, a lot of people in the the brothels um, seem to really support that team and even though that team is very clearly anti-sex work and into slut shaming by team and, you mean republicans yeah yeah okay. yeah so um it they yeah, it's definitely doesn't seem in line with <laughs> with their party values it's not it's not but they they even though it even though they like to say that they no are about you. states rights you know and stuff like that they're not i mean yeah but anyways we don't got to get into that <laughs> i don't know i could talk for days on politics though yeah, so if yeah. you ever want to come back and talk politics <laughs> for sure no for sure okay cool well again any any other I, sorry i kind of started to ask you about politics any parting words uh, last thoughts before we break um just add me on all my platforms and um you know if if you support sex workers i am absolutely would love to be supported <laughs> while i'm not working the brothels um i'm i'm relying heavily on those platforms um and also for my burlesque um my next performance is august 6th in kansas city yeah. So uh, if you want to come out and see some great burlesque, there's other performers going to be with me. So. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I did have one last question. I just remembered something when we first started talking that you mentioned to me that I wanted to learn more about. Um, you mentioned that the, the one of the reasons you got out of the brothels is because the recession was hitting it hard. What did you mean by that? Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's a luxury service. So when... Uh, belts start getting tightened. Um, that's one belts of the first. Stop getting hits. loosened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's Sorry, the same. That was you know, a stupid when, joke. <laughs> no, no, it's actually a good one. I'm going to use that one myself uh, next time <laughs> I'm talking about this. But um, no, it it is definitely a a precursor um, in sex work. Uh, you can go to the strip clubs and you can ask a stripper how the economy is and that's who's gonna know what's coming interesting uh, you know a lot have... of, a lot of our guests are you know they play the stock market so when the stock market's about to go down they're not spending money on us um you know it's it's a good indicator of how healthy our economy is is how much money is being spent you know, and, and this summer was very slow. It was very slow and there was no point in me coming back for a while. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to stay in the Midwest for a while. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm going to school. So we're, we're just going to do that for a while and see what happens next summer. Well, um, I want to thank you again for your time. Um, 
trying to think if there's anything else. That, that... I appreciate you having me and I appreciate you uh, talking to Tori the other day too. Yeah. Um, and I look, I look forward to, to hearing more of your podcasts. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, um, I guess I wanted to just ask you personally, this is a set, setting aside our, our total conversation you mentioned cannabis earlier. I'm just curious, how do you view the subject of drug decriminalization? Do you think it should be decriminalized too? To Absolutely. Argue? Okay, cool. Uh, awesome. I feel like all drugs should be legalized and Hell decriminalized. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, having safe places to do the things that humans are going to do them anyway. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, we're just not progressive of a country enough to be where we need to be yeah we don't we don't seem for for the land of the free we seem to restrict a lot of freedom we do and and i can preface this by saying i like tylenol is my drug of choice i don't do anything uh i don't i did used to smoke weed i've done lots of drugs in my you know 20s and in my teen years and i don't anymore uh i'm a boring old lady now uh, but i I feel very strongly that, you know. Do you think it's kind of lame that the brothels search people and don't let you bring drugs in? I mean, I get that you can't do drugs while you're working, but like. No, I, I, I don't feel like that is a safe environment, creates a safe environment. Fair. Um, you know, do I think they should drug test? No, I don't care if they do drugs, just don't do them there. Now, to be clear, though, they drug test, but they don't at, they don't look for they don't care about cannabis, do they? No, they don't drug test. Oh, they they don't drug test. OK, no, I, I'm just saying, like, I don't care if if somebody there does drugs on sure. their own time, but I don't feel like it creates a safe environment for everybody. Um, it's it's kind of on the lines of consent. Like, yeah. I don't do you think to live with uh, somebody who's doing drugs. And right. you're technically living there, so. Yeah, I mean, do you think people should, I mean, I'm sure you would agree, people should be able to smoke weed in the brothel. I know that there's a reason why that can't happen, but do you agree that they should? Because, I mean, they can drink alcohol. That's my thing. You guys have a bar that's open. I mean, I feel like if they did it like they do, because before COVID, they allowed smoking inside the bar. Oh. I would hate my life completely. I worked in strip clubs when smoking was legal in bars in Texas is where sure. I used to strip. And um, here comes the other one. <laughs> and um, I don't smoke. I don't want to be around smoke. I don't want to smell smoke. Um, so if they were to do it outside in the smoking area, I don't care. I don't care. Um, what are they going to do? Like eat a bunch of snacks? You know, I, it's fine. Yeah, uh, I don't I don't want it in my lungs um, because I can't I can't do it. Um, yeah. That's the only reason I don't smoke. So it's kind of the same thing. Like, I don't care if they do other drugs. Just don't involve me in it and don't. Yeah. You know, so I don't think that that's a safe place for that kind of thing. Yeah. So I got a question, a, a good question for you as we as we part. Um, if I was a girl. Um, and it's funny, I was about to say, uh, people, if you've got your kids around, this is a part where you want to get them away from, but it's like, why are you listening to this with your kids anyways? Anyways, though, <laughs> uh, uh, if I was a girl and I wanted to experience oral sex with you, um, I'm just thinking about like, you know, a male is required to put a condom on, like, what, how does that work? Are you allowed to just give me oral sex as a girl? Um, so in the brothels, we use dental dams. Uh, I have a, an allergy. Is it something to you put on your mouth? No, it goes across the pubic area. Oh, uh, it's a layer of latex and it's, um, I kind of, so it's think like, of a, it like, is it like a condom? Have you ever seen Saniderm? Okay. Seen yeah, Saniderm? yeah. Kind of similar to Saniderm. I, as I rub my arm, because this is the only tattoo I've ever had Saniderm on. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's kind of similar. Like it, you stick it on there and you can feel um, things, but I can't use them because I, I have a latex allergy. So I used saran wrap. 
so but then you can't what if i was a girl that wanted you to do oral and penetrate me you would just put the the saran wrap on my clitoris or something or what yeah i mean you can put it over the top of it and um uh my little bag for you know safe sex implements includes saran wrap condoms and uh non-latex gloves um, lubrication at, well and of course yeah lube <laughs> um yeah uh definitely lube but as far as you know actual devices of safety um those are the three things that i use in the the brothel experience um so you know are you getting the same experience yeah we would actually have people come in and they we would walk them because they well i'm not going to use the condom well you have to so <laughs> If you don't want to use a condom, then you're not going to have sex here. It's the same thing. If you're not going to use a dental dam or um, saran wrap in my case, then you're not going to get that experience. And that's my rule. Yep. <laughs> hey, simple and to the point. Um, yeah. Cool. I was just curious. I was like, what is the female equivalent of a condom or yeah. you know, the, the women, of whatever. That's it. Um, it's so, a dental dam. Yeah. Okay, cool. Interesting. Well, I am fresh out of questions for now. I'd love to have you back on in the future. Um, I'm sure I'll, yeah, I'm sure I'll come up with other questions. I hope you had a good time today, folks. I hope yeah. uh, that you enjoyed this episode and definitely uh, check out those links in the podcast description to connect with May. Uh, support your local or support your sex workers, folks. They're doing a, um, you know, a good service to society. So I think that's important. So uh, thank you very much. And we'll see you next time on the Chillinoy Podcast. Thanks. See you later.